This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. Start your journey with the superb on-demand video streaming service Magellan TV and watch their new release, Dick Winters, Hang Tough. Enjoy watching this fantastic story about the highly decorated war veteran, commander of the U.S. Parachute Infantry Regiment during World War II. Richard Davis Winters was an officer of the U.S. Army and commander of the 2nd Battalion Parachute Infantry Regiment. At dawn on D-Day, he landed with his parachute unit and bravely fought through France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and all the way to Germany. We at Simple History wanted to show you a story about a notorious prison built by the French in the late 19th century for political prisoners. During the Vietnam War, it was used for American prisoners of war captured by the North Vietnamese Army and famously called Hanoi Hilton by the inmates. Join the Magellan TV streaming service and explore their excellent selection of documentaries, plenty of 4K videos, and ad-free content that allows five simultaneous streams per account while supporting offline downloads even on mobile devices. Click the link in the description to try out Magellan TV, get a one-month free trial, and join us in the next Magellan TV documentary. The Hanoi Hilton, Wa Lao Prison, Hanoi, The Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War, around 2,500 American soldiers were reported as being prisoners of war or missing in action. When the war ended for the United States in 1973, only 591 of them returned home. The rest remained in prison camps across North and South Vietnam. The majority of American POWs were captured by the North Vietnamese Army. They spent their captivity in some of the 13 POW camps in the country. The most notorious of these was the Hoa La Prison, located in Hanoi. It was generally referred to by its inmates as the Hanoi Hilton. Prison Conditions The prison was built by the French in the late 19th century to house political prisoners who were supporters of Vietnamese independence from their French colonial rulers. In 1954, when the French left the country, the prison was converted into a communist education center. It didn't last long, however, before Hoa La became a prison once again when the Vietnam War started. It soon became an exclusive prison for American POWs. The first U.S. prisoner to arrive at Hoa La was Lieutenant Everett Alvarez, Jr. He had been shot down in his Douglas A-4 Skyhawk dive bomber in August 1964 during Operation Pierce Arrow. Soon, other American POWs began arriving. Most of them were pilots who had been shot down over North Vietnam. One of the most famous inmates was a pilot named John McCain, who went on to become a U.S. Senator and a presidential candidate. He too had to eject from his A-4 Skyhawk dive bomber in 1967 when it was hit by a missile and crash landed into Truk Bok Lake in Hanoi. He was rescued from drowning by some locals, but despite having a broken leg and two fractured arms caused by the ejection, he was punched and kicked by the mob, and even had a bayonet thrust into his foot before being taken to a local military hospital for medical treatment and then transferred to the Hoa La prison. The Hanoi Hilton was actually a prison complex in the center of Hanoi. It consisted of a number of prison wings, or sectors, joined together by a central courtyard. Like the prison itself, these sectors had ironic nicknames, such as New Guy Village, Heartbreak Hotel, Little Vegas, Camp Unity, and some others. Cell blocks were on the ground floor buildings with 16-inch brick walls and red tiles on the roof. Each prison building had numerous cells inside. The typical cell housed four prisoners and would have been large enough to house bunk beds made of wooden boards on either side of the doorway. Each bed was fitted with iron leg stocks or shackles and resembled more of a torture device than a bed. Prisoners were held behind heavy iron doors with peepholes that were used by the guards to control and intimidate the inmates. On the opposite wall, high up near the ceiling, was a barred window that had no cover. It stayed open all year round, despite the weather. Each cell was illuminated with a small light bulb that was permanently left on. Most cells had no toilet or washing facilities, so the prisoners had to relieve themselves into small rusty buckets. On hot summer days, living in such conditions was unbearable. Hygiene in general was at the lowest level possible, and apart from the fact that the cells were extremely dirty, they were also infested with rats, cockroaches, mice, and other vermin. Prisoners had absolutely no opportunity to maintain personal hygiene. Weeks, sometimes months passed between them being allowed to even have a shower. Cells were not only filthy and humid, but were utterly depressing. Drawings and inscriptions scribbled by the inmates on the walls just intensified the hopelessness of life in the Hanoi Hilton. 
everyday life. Wall Law Prison earned its ironic nickname after the famous hotel chain solely for the reason of its ultimate inhospitability. The harsh conditions of the living space in prison were deemed suitable for the American POWs, as the North Vietnamese government designated them as normal criminals and treated them accordingly. There were strict camp regulations on how the prisoners should behave and what their rights and duties were. First of all, the prisoners were obliged to obey every order without question. Any attempt to refuse to answer a question resulted in severe punishment. Prisoners were even punished if they refused to eat their rations. On the other hand, prisoners had to pay the utmost respect to their guards and officers in the camp. Any talking among the prisoners was also strictly forbidden. Instead, they were welcome to enjoy regular propaganda brainwashing through box speakers. Each night, the radio program of the famous Hanoi Hanna ended with a message. GIs, why should you die thousands of miles from home? Lay down your arms now and cross over to the people's side. The food that the POWs were given was just something else that made their lives miserable. The average meal for a POW in the Hanoi Hilton was a bowl of greasy vegetable soup and a cup of rice. The only thing that ever changed was the vegetables used. It was either pumpkin, cabbage, or a strange vegetable called the sewer greens by the POWs. The diet, lacking any proper protein or energy, caused serious health problems to the prisoners. Almost all of them suffered from a vitamin deficiency and lost about 20% of their body mass. The lack of proper food was a real hardship in the winter months. With a low energy intake, the prisoners were unable to warm their bodies, and with the cell windows open all year long, many of them struggled to survive the cold. Tap code. Although communication among the prisoners was strictly forbidden, maintaining contact among themselves was still vital. It allowed them to receive information from the outside world from new inmates, learn about different interrogation tortures, and share their experiences. Most importantly, they were able to encourage each other and build a level of morale as well as a sense of unity. Despite the horrors they endured, the American POWs in the Hanoi Hilton didn't lack ingenuity. Instead of verbal communication, they designed a special tap code for passing on messages. Tap code was similar to Morse code and used a 5x5 five five matrix of the alphabet and was physically banged out on walls or metal doors in the cells. Letters were identified by two sets of taps, one for the column and the other for the row. Prisoners standardized abbreviations in order to ease communication via the tap code. There was even a simple system for encrypting messages. It was a perfect way of communication of which the North Vietnamese guards were completely unaware was going on. Torture. Life in the Hanoi Hilton was bad enough as it was, but prisoners were constantly exposed to torture. They could be tortured for several reasons, to impart information, to be forced to cooperate, or just purely for the guards' entertainment. Most tortures were held during the interrogations. The first level was psychological torture. Prisoners were exposed to isolation, starvation, sleep denial, and constant brainwashing sessions. After only a few days of such treatment, their ability to resist further interrogation decreased significantly. The American POWs usually managed to withstand this kind of torture, much to the fury of their interrogators, who would then resort to the physical torture. The basic kind of physical torture was simple but brutal, with the beating of prisoners while they were tied to stools. This was, unfortunately, only a prelude to even worse torture. The NVA guards and interrogators were quite creative in their torturing techniques. Prisoners were blindfolded and forced to run around the courtyard while being dragged along by a noose. They would then be thrown into trenches or small cages where they would spend several days in cramped positions. There were, however, two torturing methods that were considered much worse. The first was a rope trick, a torture that involved binding a prisoner's arms behind their back, which would then rotate upward until their shoulders popped out of their sockets. In this position, the prisoners were hung from meat hooks secured to the ceiling. There was a variation of this method that involved tying both hands and feet together and then binding the hands to the ankles behind the back. To make the method even worse, while hanging from the ceiling, some prisoners were often brutally beaten with sticks. The second method was the twisted cuff treatment. Prisoners had their arms tied behind their backs with handcuffs that had a ratchet attached. The cuffs were then tightened to a degree where two bones bent together as one. There were examples where both of these sadistic methods were used together. Unfortunately for the American prisoners, torture didn't stop with the interrogations. Even during their stay in the cells, POWs were exposed to abuse by having their legs placed in iron shackles at the bottom of the bed. In addition, iron pipes were installed to put pressure on the shins. Prisoners lay in such positions with their hands tied behind their back for days on end. 
All that time they had to defecate where they lay, and this would attract the rats and cockroaches that would crawl all over their bodies. On top of everything, the lack of medical care after the torture was also a kind of maltreatment, especially because the guards enjoyed picking at the prisoners' wounds. The worst period for torturing was after the failed escape plan in the spring of 1969. However, it all stopped in September, the same year that Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh died. It was practically impossible for any prisoners to withstand this continuous torture and abuse, and eventually each of them reached his breaking point. The interrogators would manage to extort some kind of information or confession from them. However, prisoners had their own way of manipulating their interrogators. Many of the coerced confessions were made up and full of nonsense. One such confession came from an airman who promised to not fly any further missions against the North Vietnamese. He called himself Lieutenant Clark Kent, who was, of course, better known to the American public as Superman, the comic book hero. Life in the Hanoi Hilton prison produced extreme physical, mental, and emotional stress for its POWs. It was especially difficult for those who had spent years inside the prison. The record was held by Lieutenant Everett Alvarez Jr., the first American POW to come to the Hanoi Hilton. He had spent eight years and seven months in captivity. He was released on February 12, 1973 with the first batch of American POWs that returned home as part of Operation Homecoming. The last POW left in March 1973. In the years to follow, former prisoners shared their experiences with the American and international public with the horrors they suffered at the Hanoi Hilton. The United States government never charged the North Vietnamese for the war crimes they committed. <laughs>